The more advanced forms, we, evolve from less advanced forms, why are there still less advanced forms? Hmm? 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 Gotcha now, huh? <laughs> so if we came from monkeys, hmm, which we didn't, okay, but why are there monkeys? Well, it's a question that's reasonable. It's a reasonable question if you're not in biology knowledge. <laughs> First of all, we have to understand that if species don't necessarily increase in complexity over time, this is misunderstanding. Ask your local sponge. Okay? The sponge is sucking on the rocks, they've been sucking on the rocks for tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. And they're sitting around going, gotta be a human, have to be a human, why be a human now? No, they're going, it's great being a sponge, I'm doing, I'm doing really well as a sponge, thank you very much. So when you look at things like coral, sea anemones, they're not all striving to be human, they're beautifully adapted to what they do. So misunderstanding is everything is trying to become human, would that be a bummer? Okay? So that's actually not how the evolution works. And to get to the second part of that question, well, if primitive forms give rise to advanced forms, why do we still have primitive forms? Again, an obvious question and an appropriate question. Let's take a look at fishes. We tell you that fishes evolved from, excuse me, that amphibians evolved from fish ancestors, which begs the question, well, wait a minute. Then why do we still have fishes? The fishes give rise to amphibians. Because one small group of fishes, fishes are the most common vertebrate on the planet, species-wise, about 40,000 species, which makes sense because 84% of our planet is water. So we have a whole bunch of fishes, but a very small group, you see on the left-hand side, all the lobe fin fishes, they're the guys that give rise to you. If you understand that, please raise your pectoral fin. <laughs> Okay, that's where they came from. Everybody wig your pelvic fins. Okay, so that's where the appendages came from. We get that. What did the other 99% of those fish species spend their evolutionary time doing? Becoming what? Better adapted fish. Uh, you guys are ready. You're in danger of guys right in here, okay? This is good. So we don't have one, you know, the whole group doesn't turn into another. It gets back to that question, well, we came from primate ancestors, why do we still have primates? It's a misunderstanding that A begets B, mostly because of that, that iconography of evolution we see where you have the chimpanzee that turns into the cro magnum that turns into the, you know? And it's a great graphic, but that assumes that all evolution is linear, right? There are no branches, and that's just a misnomer there. You're going to love this one. I kept hoping this one was going to die. It keeps coming back. Thank you, Creation Museum. Okay? If you, if you haven't been, you really need to go and ride on the Triceratops. Okay? So, the question here is, if dinosaurs and humans were contemporaries, you know, because it's a problem, if we say that dinosaurs disappeared, the big guys, disappeared 65 million-ish years ago, that's a problem with the six to 10,000 year old Earth, isn't it? Hmm. Okay? Hmm. That means in order to make this fit, they had to be contemporaries, didn't they? Yeah. So this is where you get this, in, but you know, the dinosaurs, it's interesting, in all studies done in five different countries, students on scientific surveys correctly identify the disappearance of the dinosaurs as 65 million years ago, but they'll identify the age of the Earth as being six to 10,000 years old. Yeah. Don't see the conflict, okay? <laughs> So what you see here, if dinosaurs and humans weren't contemporaries, so if they weren't together at the same time, then why do we see human footprints and dinosaur footprints together at Paloxy River, Texas? And many of you I think are probably familiar with this. This is Paloxy River here. And Roland Bird, uh, back in 1938, discovered the Paloxy River prints during a dry period. On this left-hand side, you can see where they're excavated out, and it looks like they're dinosaur footprints, and it looks like if you've had a couple margaritas, human footprints side by side, okay? And so they go, well, how do you explain that one? You know, how do you explain that one? Dinosaurs and humans side by side. It is amazing. As we say, you know, we, we, we see that uh, it was said in the past that, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I take the opposite view. Extraordinary claims only require ordinary evidence. Just give me like, you see, you give birth to Bigfoot's baby. Just show me the baby. I don't need to see the conception, okay? Ordinary evidence will be just fine. So, so here's what you have. This, uh, you can go to, this is Bible.ca where you can get these prints here. So here's a half a person on the right-hand side showing you who would agree to be human footprints on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, here's a close-up, bottom left-hand side, apparently three footprints together. So here we have three people hanging out. Okay? And here's the sequence going along here. Now look at this. 
all the way along there, and it is amazing. Okay, and again, what we like to do in science is say, that's interesting. Let's see if we can explain the phenomenon. Because we'll see as we're in our capstone here, science can only seek to explain events in nature based upon the laws of nature. Not supernatural intervention, not magic, not witchcraft, and not because of Harry Potter's influence. It has to be based upon aspects of nature. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, here's what you can see on the, this website, which there are many websites that promote this event, but do you see a human footprint there yet? No. No, okay? They're nice, they clean it up for you. So in their next Photoshop version, they take the water out and they darken the bottom. Can you see a footprint yet? Feel free to say no, be honest, because it's a relationship we've built already here. Okay. <laughs> Are we getting any closer? No. Yeah? Okay. And in case you, see, this is where we're better after lunch. I know that you don't really have margaritas, you'd be able to squint and see the footprints. There you go. Okay. They outline them for you. Now you see the footprint. Okay. Okay. That, that looks, that looks, okay. <laughs> But on the right hand side, after they finished photoshopping it, my god, that's my foot. That's a size 13 right there. Okay, I recognize my toes just about. So it's pretty obvious. You say, okay, well, what's going on here? Well, if it turns out that the human prints are actually impressions from a small theropod. The group of dinosaurs on the left hand side are called theropods. Uh, they're related to Velociraptor, T Rex, and then the sauropods, which you probably knew as uh, brontosaurus, etc., back in the day before you learned them and we changed their names. And so now, now they're called sauropods. But actually, this is a sequence of these two types of dinosaurs walking together. You say, well, just saying that so doesn't make it so. Where's your evidence of that? Well, if you take a look here at what they claim to be the human footprints, you notice that they have claw marks in the back of them? Which, if you check your heels when you go home, even if you haven't sanded in a while, you probably don't have any claws there. So there's a bit of an issue there, okay? In one series, the human and dinosaur tracks alternate left and right. So we have, we have a dinosaur, human, dinosaur, human, dinosaur. So apparently, they were not scotching along. It's a bit, a bit of a problem for the evidence there. But here's even a bigger issue. Let's assume that that's, that's, we, we buy that. It turns out that humans do not appear in the strata, this geologic strata, okay, the Polexi age, anywhere else in the planet. So if they occurred at this place in Texas, that means humans were on the planet 107 million years ago. See any issues with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lucy's 4.2 million years old. So this means that here on the planet and nowhere else on the planet, there were humans 107 million years ago, and for some mysterious reason, there's no evidence anywhere else on the planet for over 100 million years. Begs the question, how do we explain that scientifically? And we can. Had humans and dinosaurs coexisted, why are there no sites on Earth anywhere where the bones of dinosaurs and humans are found together in the same strata? There are none, not a nil, silks, cook, not a single place. Begs the question. Are they misinterpreting that data? Okay. And also what's interesting, both the dinosaur footprints and the human footprints are sunk into about the same depth, which must have been really heavy people in order to sink into the mud that deep. But could we explain this data set better by saying that these were theropods? These were large dinosaurs pushed down? Sure. And also, many of the human strides, if you look at it again, well, pretty much every other, it's human, human, dinosaur, dinosaur, human, human. If you look at the strike marks here, they're too far apart, even for the tallest human. I am five foot sixteen. No. Okay. And, you know, how big a strike can you make? If you look at the strides here, there's no way that can be made by a human. So when you challenge these individuals, say, how do you account for the stride equaling someone who's ten feet tall? Do we have an answer? Yes, we do. Because apparently humans were taller back then. <laughs> This is from their website. I'm just taking it from their website. Humans were 10 feet tall back then, and that's what accounted for the stride. And of course, they were running out because the flight was coming, by the way. And so they were running. So, you know, you say, does that fit in their view of the world? Yes, would it fit scientifically? No, it would not. So, go to the Creation Museum, get a chance to ride on Triceratops, because apparently, Humans and triceratops were not only on the planet at the same time, but they were friends. 
Yeah, just like the cartoon. <laughs> we hear this one sometimes also. How can a complex structure or complex organism evolve by chance, right? But how do you account for something as complex as a human by just mere chance alone? What are the odds of that? And that's a fair question. You sometimes see it rephrased though, like this one. They go, what is the probability that when all the parts in a junkyard are thrown up into the air, that upon hitting the ground will form a jumbo jet? <laughs> Statisticians will be happy to calculate that one for you, by the way, okay? So is it possible versus probable, right? Possibility versus probability. You'll also hear it another way here, you'll say, this is from another website, uh, or a simple organism consisting of only 100 parts could combine these 100 parts into 10 to 158, okay, possible ways. How is it even possible that the right combination could occur in the simple animal, let alone something complex like humans? So look at how many parts make up us. What's the probability that it could happen by chance? Because clearly there was a God involved by this, right? An intelligent designer in the process. Well, my hero, Mark Twain, there are three types of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics, okay? <laughs> so as soon as, you know, people start throwing numbers at you, most of us get that during the headlines, so like a teacher special, I don't know, I'll get back to you. And the good news is, we can't get back to them, right? You say, well, that's an interesting challenge, but let me find out and I'll get back to you. The other one you hear here is, what's the probability that a monkey sitting at the keyboard could randomly hit and, and type Hamlet? Well, I, we don't have time to do this today, but I have a background program I normally hit right here, and I had a, a program I, that I had written to, that comes up with to be or not to be, and it's a random generator program, and you can see, if you have a program that, that background operating saying, if you get T as the first letter in to be or not to be, save it, erase all the others. If you get O as the second letter, save it, erase all the others. It takes on average about six and a half minutes to get to be or not to be. So could the could a chimpanzee theoretically do this? Possible, yes. Probable, no. So probably something else has to be going on. Because it turns out that acting upon the very, very, very random roll of the dice that is genetic variation is a very, very non-random process called what? Natural selection. And this is why Darwin and Wallace, you know, all the way over at number 31 to publish on the fact of evolution, 30 other authors have published. Why were they famous or infamous, depending upon your perspective? They were the first one to provide a mechanism, which is the mechanism of natural selection. So acting upon the very random event that is genetic variation, you have a very non-random process, which is natural selection. Now, can we evolve complex structures? Sure, okay? So we'll get back to that in a second. But actually, let's go back to that. Let me, let me, you say, okay, how about the human eye? This is one that's normally given to you. The human eye is so complex, how could that evolve by chance? It seems astounding that it could. But understand that rarely does everything, anything in nature happen the first time out and happen the same way. We know that the animal eye has evolved at least on 12 different pathways. And not all vertebrates have the same type of eye. Not all animals have the same type of eye. You say, but how do you get to it, right? How do you get your way there? You say, well, okay, what would happen if I gave you the chance to have no vision whatsoever or to see light versus dark? What's your option? Light versus dark. Might that confer survival advantage for you? Sure. And how about I give you the advantage of the question of do you want light from dark vision or do you want silhouettes, black and white silhouettes? What are we going to go for? Black and white silhouettes. Might that confer a greater survival advantage? Now, here's your next option. Black and white detail, or do you want silhouettes? Detail. Do you want black and white detail or color detail? Didn't every one of those steps confer a survival advantage to you? Yeah. And that's what we see in nature. We see the intermediate steps resulting in what the anti-evolutionists like, ah, the vertebrate eye, how do you account for that? Quite easily, how much time do you have? We'd be happy to show you those procedures. Here's the other one here. Since mutations are harmful to the gene pool, how can mutations be the driving force of evolution? The fallacy here is that the only good mutation is no mutation, right? That all mutations are bad, and most of these would be bad, right? right? Like the two-faced cat, like there's any other kind. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look here. 
The affecting mutation can be positive, negative, or neutral. How about the, the five-legged lamb? Positive, negative, or neutral? Negative. Is that an organism going to live long enough to pass on the genes for being five legs? No. Natural selection is going to go, too bad, so sad, sayonara, wrong environment, wrong time, you're out of here. Okay? How about the cat on the right hand side? That's a neutral mutation. As long as it doesn't hinder its reproductive success, just having one green eye and one blue eye looking like a really, really creepy cat <laughs> prevent any disadvantage or advantage to you? No. Probably what? A neutral mutation. Okay? Now, how about our moose at the bottom? These are Michigan moose. These are from Marquette, Michigan. We have a population now of moose that are white and some of them are brown. Positive, negative, or neutral? Depends what time you were talking, right? <laughs> Can you see the issues here? Yeah. So, we used to say only time will tell, now we say only wolves will tell. So, we're going to get back to you on this one. We'll tell you which one those are. Okay? This would be what kind of mutation? It says, bummer of a birthmark, Hal. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Negative mutation, I'm just thinking here, okay? <laughs> so, this is how nature operates on mutations. <laughs> so, you think, so what's the driving force of natural selection? It's positive mutations. Mutations are what drive. Sure, sexual selection has an issue. Sure, immigration and immigration. The driving force of gene pool diversification? Mutations. Positive mutations. Here are some mutations you don't want to see. Okay? <laughs> That's a true bird dog up here. Okay? Cats a problem in the neighborhood? Not anymore. <laughs> Which one of these is the most scary for you? The cat quinn? Yeah, most of them. That's just on a creep index of 1 to 10. It's about 12. Okay, yeah. so, I actually, actually have some, some K-12 teachers who I say, are those real? <laughs> Are you teaching science? <laughs> Here's the other one. Another question. If evolution did occur, why are there transitional forms in the record? Because if we have, for instance, fossil 1 and we have fossil 10, where's fossil 5? It's a neat find fossil 5. Okay, but if you have 1 and 5 and 10, where's 3 and 7? So we find 1, 3, 5, 7, and 10. You go, okay, well, we're 6. We can't find 6. Ah! <laughs> Well, there are a lot of transitional forms. Would you consider to be the missing species? The missing links? It turns out most missing links aren't missing at all. They're found links. We have them. And many of them are still extant, which means currently living. Let me give you some numbers here. These will not be in the test afterwards. Okay? I'll give you the numbers here in a second. Here's my analogy. Some of you folks have heard this before, but I just love it, so I do it any kind of can. Let's talk about do we need to know all the information? Most of you are a learning group in here. You know about Moby Dick, you've yeah. read Moby Dick. What if you've never read Moby Book? Oh, Moby Book? <laughs> the, the book Moby Dick, pardon my dyslexia. What if I took out every even number chapter, chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 6, and you've never read the book and I said, now read it? Are you going to understand the general human story? Don't you know there's a really angry white whale? There's some captain with a wooden leg. Don't we know who wins? Okay? Now, in reading every other chapter, you get the theme of Moby Dick. Do you get the nuances of the character development, though, for every character? No, but don't you understand the story? Yeah. Do you need every chapter? No. Do you need every fossil? No. No. So we take a look here. G was back. In all the world's museums today, there are about 250,000 fossil species, not fossils, but fossils of individual plant and animal species. That's a paucity. That's a quarter of a million plants and animals. So you think, well, how many are there? Today, there are about 10 to 40 million extant currently living species. So with multicellular life first appearing on the planet like oh, 670 million years ago, if you extrapolate, there have to have been hundreds or possibly thousands of millions of species that have lived on this planet at one time. But yet, how many fossils do we have? A quarter of a million. So what's the theme? Do organisms that exist on the planet become fossilized or not? Usually not. A very, very small percentage of species become fossilized and are not destroyed. But do we need every chapter of Moby Dick? No. But the anti-evolutionists will grab on and go, ah, you're missing the one of the fossil series. <laughs> yes, we are. What's your point? God, I'm sure you're missing it. You have to understand, we don't need all the fossils. Okay. Let's take a look here at this one. You hear this a lot? 
Doesn't the second law of thermodynamics prove that evolution is impossible? Or another way to add it, evolutionists say that the universe and life moves from chaos to order and from simple to complex, the exact opposite of the second law. I know all of you right now have brought up that file that says laws of thermodynamics, and it's germane in your memory. Anywhere event that it isn't, here are the laws of thermodynamics. One, energy cannot be created or destroyed, a very zen concept, okay? Two, physical systems tend to proceed toward a state of greater disorder or entropy. So the challenge here is, if you're telling us organisms become more complex, if you're telling us to become more diverse, isn't that in violation of the second law when you say things become greater entropy, greater chaos? You know, it would seem so, but there are two issues. The first issue, the second law only deals with closed systems, where no energy is input into the system. Now, this is Michigan, but a couple days per year you go outside and there's a big glowing thing up in the sky. <laughs> it's called the sun, okay? That's what gives us our energy. So, when you have energy in your, second, in your system, does the second law even apply? No. no. However, if we look at the second law, phys physical systems tend to proceed toward a state of greater disorder and entropy. Wouldn't the Genesis account of creation be the greatest violation of the second law? Yeah. <laughs> but they don't want to mention that one. Okay? And we, we've talked about life doesn't necessarily evolve from simple to complex or from chaos to order. Here you go. Isn't it true that nobody has ever actually seen a new species during their lifetime? Well, you'd have to be blind not to observe, observe that. But sure, we see species evolve during our lifetime. This gets back to that if you can't see it, it's not happening, right? You have to see it with your own eyes. Well, no. This is really common in plants. Plants do something called non-disjunction. Um, they can actually double, triple, quadruple the number of chromosomes. When you eat your watermelon this, this summer, it's an octopoid. It has eight pairs of chromosomes. What do you want to say to biologists? Thank you. That's how you get these massive watermelons. This isn't new. We've been doing this for since the 20s. It's not genetically engineered. The roses, the strawberries, these all have multiple sets of chromosomes in them. This is why you get these monsters. Do you think strawberries grow this big in the wild? No. Okay? Think of plant, plant geneticists near you. But it happens naturally in the wild. And so we can see in one generation a plant give rise to a genetically, reproductively isolated offspring in one generation, which by definition makes a new species. Plants do it all the time. Bacteria happens all the time. Do you know that bacteria are capable of doing something really, really creepy? If you look over here, this is a bacterium right here. They can actually take genetic material from the environment and bring it into their body from different species. This is like you walking down the street and seeing a roadkill skunk and going, that looks like some cool DNA. Picking it up and then you stink for the rest of your life. <laughs> Just think if you could randomly pick up genes from the environment. Bacteria do that all the time, making them what? Reproductively isolate. They can also do something called, viruses do something called transduction. They actually insert genes from other bacteria, completely unrelated. Boom! Making them different species. And then they do something called conjugation or reproduction. Bacteria do this all the time. We see new species occurring before our eyes all of the time. Or oh, mold and fungus. What's that? Mold and fungus, is it? Mold, fungus, we see, we see antibiotic resistance, right? Yeah. Uh, all the time. If evolution is a gradual process, which Darwin suggested, how can there be gaps between species, right? They go, okay, well, so wait a minute. So you have like a five-toed horse, you have a three-toed horse, you have a two-toed horse. Where are, why are there gaps if everything's gradual? We now recognize since 1972, so not recent history, that graduation doesn't, uh, uh, evolution doesn't always happen gradually. The classic example of horse evolution, horses have how many toes now? One. It's a oh, point, but it's the center one here. And their hoof is really their toenail, isn't it? That's why you have to shave them down. But horses, if you look at horse evolution, at one point had five toes, four toes, three toes, two and one. I'm making the math easy. It was five, four and a half, etc. But that happened gradually. But does it always happen that way? No. We now recognize that it can happen in what's called a punctuated event. For instance, you know the sheep I showed you here, the lamb that had five legs? Yeah. Did its parents have four and three quarters? The great-grandparents have four and a half? No, it happens in one generation. We know how to do this now. 
we can do it in the lab, we understand the genetics, so it can happen in one generation. So we understand that there can be gaps in the fossil record for a lot of reasons, including natural events. Okay. Let's take a look here at the, the, there actually is funded by a local entrepreneur from West Michigan. There is a Grand Canyon Institute that tries to show that the Grand Canyon is less than six to 10,000 years old and it's trying to dispel scientific gradualism, etc. So the question here is, is the stratification of the fossil record actually a result of hydrodynamic sorting and therefore doesn't actually represent the appearance of new life forms over time? What does this mean? Hydrodynamic sorting means that as the great flood was coming, those animals able to run fastest away from the rising floodwaters were entrapped last in the sediments of the flood. So if we were to look at the Grand Canyon, we'd see that down at the bottom strata are the most primitive forms. As we move up towards the top, you get more advanced forms, vertebrates. Towards the top, you get mammals and birds. So in science, of course, we would explain that differently because we don't know. In hydrologic sorting, you're saying it's really an artifact of the animal's ability to run away and flee the rising floodwaters. Really, okay, if in fact hydrodynamic sorting did occur, somewhere on this planet, shouldn't there be interstratic contaminants? Shouldn't you have a horse who was running away and fell dead next to the sponge? <laughs> Shouldn't you have the pterodactyl that went the wrong way, smashed into the cliff, and died next to the mammal? But nowhere on the planet do you see these interstatic contaminants. And then why would all turtles come in the Mesozoic? Can't turtles swim? Why do they all occur in one layer? Did they decide to just, I'm going to die swimming, we're all going to drown here, okay, in the Mesozoic? <laughs> And what about trilobites, which we have here in Michigan? You know, trilobites are the first simple arthropods. Trilobites are, occur in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and the fishes are up towards the top. But wait a minute, neither of those are capable of drowning. So why were they separated there? Scientists, of course, would say this is a result of evolutionary changes over time, not hydrodynamic sorting. But hey, what about the zucchini? Okay, this is from an Ann Arbor artist. Okay? What if Noah was a vegan? Okay? So why do we see in the same fossil record stratification by complexity of plants also? You know, did the Angus birds make it to the top of the Grand Canyon because they could run faster than the mosses? 